All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. Welcome. If you're new, thank you for taking time out of your day to check the video out. We have more PlayStation news, rumors, and leaks to go over and cover here today. And we're starting once again with Stellar Blade. Apparently, a sequel is already being talked about for Stellar Blade. But before I go over that, I do just want to remind everybody that the demo is live now on PlayStation 5 for Stellar Blade. So if you're interested in trying the game out for yourself, you can download that demo. But reading here from PlayStation Lifestyle, PS5 exclusive Stellar Blade has yet to be released, but there's already talk of Stellar Blade 2. Developer ShiftUp seems keen to explore possibilities if its comments in a recent interview are anything to go by. However, the studio made it clear that it needs to sell enough copies of the upcoming game first. The comments come from ShiftUp CEO Hyung Tae Kim in a recent interview with Famitsu, Kim was quizzed about protagonist Eve's age and if players will find out how old she is as the game progresses. Kim responded by saying that those who are curious about Eve's age should play Stellar Blade and suggested that if there's enough demand for another entry, we may find out the character's age in the sequel. It's possible that Kim's comments were made in jest, but it's equally possible that Sony will order a sequel should the first game do well. At the very least, Shift Up doesn't seem opposed to the idea of working on a second installment. And so, yeah, it's again one of these situations where the developers making it clear that we would love to do a sequel, we would love to probably make some kind of franchise out of Stellar Blade, but it really depends on how the first game does. I think the good news here is that Stellar Blade seems like it's poised to do very well. It's pre-ordering very well. There's a lot of excitement for it a lot of enthusiasm and most importantly based off of what we've seen of the game so far it does look very promising so let me know if you think we're going to get a sequel to stellar blade and if you want a sequel to stellar blade moving on to the next topic we have a significant update for dragon's dogma 2 on the ps5 this is again coming from playstation lifestyle as promised capcom has rolled out dragon's dogma 2 update 1.050 which improves PS5 performance and fixes numerous bugs. The update is currently only available on the PS5 and PC, with the Xbox Series X and S versions to follow in the next few days. So going over some of the updates here for the PlayStation 5 as well as Steam, they added the option to start a new game when save data already exists, which is great because that was a major complaint with Dragon's Dogma 2. You can change the number of Art of Metamorphosis items available at Pawn Guilds in the game to 99, another big improvement for the game. Another update here is making the quest that allows players to acquire their own dwelling where they can save and rest available earlier in the game, miscellaneous text display issues, and miscellaneous bug fixes. Now, when it comes to the updates uh, that are specific for the PlayStation 5, they added the option to switch motion blur on and off, which is, again, another very welcome update. They added the option to switch ray tracing on and off, and they also added the option to set the frame rate to a max of 30 FPS. In other words, you now have the ability to lock the frame rate to 30 if you don't want the frame rate fluctuating up and down. And on Steam, it says they improved the quality when DLSS Super Resolution is enabled and they fixed an issue related to the display of models under some specific settings. So there you go. The first major update for Dragon's Dogma 2, I think it addresses quite a few different things that players have been uh, kind of complaining about. So let me know if you've been playing Dragon's Dogma 2 and what you think of it and what you think of this update. Moving on to the next topic, we are talking once again about Helldivers 2. This is being reported by Gaming Bolt that says with a new major order to take down the automatons in Helldivers 2, which players generally feel disdain for, it seems about right to receive some new armaments. Arrowhead Game Studios has confirmed the addition of two new weapons, the LAS-99 Quasar Cannon and the MG-101 Heavy Machine Gun. The former requires hovering the cursor over an an enemy and then charging it up. It's not ideal against smaller or medium sized units, but it does perform well against automaton dropships. On the other hand, the MG 101 shreds foot soldiers and even medium sized terminids. The recoil is pretty hefty, so running and gunning with it can be more of a challenge. So, yes, 
updates to Helldivers 2. They are continuing. More stratagems are available. I'm actually more interested in the MG 101. The Quasar Cannon definitely sounds interesting, but so far in Helldivers 2, I think my favorite weapon, just because it's fun to just, I guess, mow large quantities of enemies down and hear your character kind of scream out, is the um, stalwart machine gun. And so this new heavy machine gun definitely piques my interest. But yeah, it's nice to see Arrowhead Studios continuing to provide solid updates and content drops to Helldivers 2. There's definitely more coming. And uh, yeah, I will be sure to continue to update you guys. Let me know down in the comments below if you are still playing Helldivers 2 or if maybe you've moved on. Moving on to the next topic, though, we have more information about the PlayStation 5 Pro. And this is coming once again from Moore's Law is Dead. For those who aren't aware, Moore's Law is Dead is the first person who actually leaked the documentation uh, with the final specifications of the PS5 Pro as well as the uh, new upscaling technology. A lot of people didn't believe him, but it turns out that he was 100% correct so he also gave us more information here this is being reported by wccf tech it says while the playstation 5 pro cpu is said to offer minimal improvements over the base model it could bring more enhancements than anticipated in a new video shared this week moore's law is dead who revealed additional info on the yet to be revealed ps5 pro provided some small new updates on the system as well as on the playstation spectral super resolution upscaler According to the leaker, the console's Zen 2 CPU will be a 4 nanometer CPU, which will be denser and potentially provide additional improvements over the base model's processor, such as reduced power consumption, better cost efficiency, and smaller form factor. As such, the system could also be smaller than the base model and maybe even the slim PS5 revision that launched last year. Speaking about the system's price, Moore's Laws Dead revealed that the system could fit in the $500 price tag range if Sony wants it to. As mentioned above, the leaker also provided some new information on the PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution Upscale, which will debut with the PlayStation 5 Pro. Apparently, PSSR is not a fork of the upcoming AMD FSR 4 upscaler and has been completely developed by Sony from the ground up. As such, it will be very interesting to see if it will be a much better solution compared to AMD's FSR, especially on consoles where the superior NVIDIA DLSS is not currently available. And so, yeah, some more interesting insight here from Moore's Law is Dead. First, talking about the 4 nanometer CPU. I find it interesting that uh, we could potentially although I do think it's maybe more unlikely, see the PS5 Pro come out uh, being maybe the same size as the PS5 Slim or maybe even smaller. My guess is it's definitely going to be bigger than the PS5 Slim, but maybe smaller than the base model PS5 because the base model PS5 is absolutely colossal, although I do like the look of it better than the Slim. But yeah, that'll be interesting. It's also interesting to me that Moore's Law is Dead is speculating based on this information about the Zen 2 CPU that if Sony really wanted to, they could target a $500 price tag, assuming that's how much the digital version would cost without a disk drive. I'm not expecting that. To me, that sounds too good to be true. Um, I know that some people are expecting this because with the PS4 Pro, Sony dropped the price of the base model PS4 and then they shipped the PS5 Pro at $400. I don't think that's going to happen this time around. I think the PS5 is going to maintain its $500 price point because Sony did kind of let the shareholders know not to expect a price cut, right? So unless they change their mind, if PlayStation 5 sales begin to slow down, Sony could actually make that decision and drop the price and release the pro at 500 but my current expectation is the pro is going to be a 600 hundred dollar console and uh yeah that's i think a more reasonable expectation to have but talking about the pssr upscaling technology we're also learning that this was in fact built from the ground up by sony's engineering team i'm assuming mark cerny was leading the way with that and it's not 
you know, kind of a spin-off type situation from AMD's FSR. It's something completely new um, and it's their own proprietary technology. And because of that, people are now wondering how much better this is potentially going to be than FSR because FSR is okay. We see that implemented into consoles right now. And, you know, it, it leaves a lot to be desired and people want to see um, a more DLSS like solution for consoles because DLSS is considered significantly superior to AMD's FSR. So Sony could provide that solution in the console space with PSSR. And so, yeah, it'll be very exciting to see what they do there. But we are moving on to the next topic, which talks about an upcoming update for the PS5. This is being reported by PlayStation Lifestyle. Sony Interactive Entertainment has announced that an upcoming PS5 system update will introduce community game help, an enhancement of the existing game help feature. As the name suggests, community game help will solicit helpful tips and advice from gamers from their fellow players. As revealed on the PlayStation blog, the new game help feature will be available to all PS5 players, including those without an active PS Plus subscription. Previously, game help was only available to PS Plus subscribers, which is, you know, that's very nice to see that they kind of took that away. Um, and so now everybody will have access to it. Continues here, according to Sony, community game help is designed to expand the game's library of hints and tips, adding helpful gameplay videos from players who opt in to contribute. In other words, if players are stuck at a certain point in a given game, they'll have helpful videos pointing them in the right direction. The new feature will also include helpful tips and hints by developers themselves. Players can access community game help similar to how they access uh, the existing feature by pressing the PlayStation button on the DualSense to access the action card with the hints inside icon. This feature will also be available on the PlayStation app like the current game help. And so it says here for those who want to opt in to help their fellow gamers, uh, these are the steps that you will need to follow. Number one, go to captures and broadcast, go to captures, auto captures, community game help, and then select select participate to opt into the program. So it is worth noting that if you want to partake in this to create your own tips and guides, you do have to go in the settings and you have to opt into it. And then the second step here is you can also select the monthly capture limit to control how many videos you will allow to be captured from your gameplay per month. So yeah, really interesting update here to the PlayStation 5's help feature. I feel like this is something that has went kind of underreported. Maybe a lot of people aren't aware of this, but yeah, the help feature that the PS5 offers can be great and can be very useful, but it's basically limited to developers. Developers have to take extra time to implement this feature and most developers are opting not to because they're just too focused and too busy with actually getting the games done. So I think this is a great thing for Sony to do to kind of open this up and let players help other players out. So let me know if this is something you plan to do and participate in or something you plan to take advantage of. Moving on to the next topic, we're talking about Minecraft and how a native PS5 version is seemingly being released by Microsoft. Once again, from PlayStation Lifestyle, it looks like Microsoft and Sony have finally put their differences aside to release a native PS5 version of Minecraft. The lack of a native version somehow became a point of contention during legal proceedings against Microsoft's purchase of Activision Blizzard, with the former placing blame on Sony. The PS5 version of Minecraft was picked up by popular PlayStation Network scraper PlayStation Game Size on X. A Reddit user further listed the title's IDs for the unannounced release found on the PlayStation Store's backend. So it says, for those who may have missed the argument, the US FTC, uh, when arguing against Microsoft owning popular franchises, said that Mojang had three years to come up with a native PS5 version of Minecraft, but chose not to release one. Microsoft countered that claim by pointing its finger at Sony, accusing the company of being reluctant in providing PS5 dev kits uh, to make the release possible. Uh, so yeah, we know what happened here. We know what changed. Microsoft basically said, look, we're gonna be porting some of our games to PlayStation 5. So we're gonna need dev kits to do that because we are kind of going a bit third party here. Sony was obviously totally okay with that, provided them with as many PS5 dev kits as they want to rent. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, it just, it adds up, right? It makes sense that now we're finally going to see a native 
um, PS5 version of Minecraft. But moving on to the final topic of the video, we're talking a little bit about Rise of the Ronin, specifically the directors talking about what they would like to achieve in their next game after Rise of the Ronin being reported by VGC. The director of Rise of the Ronin says he wants to see Team Ninja's next game accomplish things that couldn't be managed this time around. Before the PS5 exclusives released last week, Fumihiko Yasuda and producer Yasuke Hayashi spoke to VGC about its development and the lessons it had taken from the experience. According to Yasuda, Rise of the Ronin is Team Ninja's first open world game and it was created to provide a change from the studio's usual output. Until now, we've been creating games based on ninjas and samurais, he told us. We wanted to create a game that has a sense of freedom as well as a rich story. For this title, we decided on the concept of Ronin. We wanted players to become a Ronin, explore an open world, and be able to affect the story. Of course, we have established a foundation with our action combat systems. Yasuda explained that the game's conception was around eight years ago, and at the time, he was playing games like Assassin's Creed and Red Dead Redemption for inspiration. However, he conceded that Ronin's open world environment provided a challenge for the studio, and he hoped his next project will learn from this. Rise of the Ronin was a big challenge for us because it's something we hadn't done up until now in terms of the level of freedom and the story while retaining the action gameplay. I believe we were able to realize the concept I and mean, I'm hoping that as players get their hands on the game, they'll be able to experience it as we originally envisioned. I think going forward, our challenge is to build from that and perhaps achieve things we weren't able to do this time and continue to build from there. Uh, producer Hayashi added, we're also trying to do a lot of things with each title, and we're always trying to utilize what we learned in the past on what we work on next. I think with Rise of the Ronin, you'll see that it's kind of an amalgamation of the games that we've worked on in previous years. We're going to utilize what we learned with Rise of the Ronin to further expand our work going forward. So yeah, I wanted to let you guys know about this because um, it's, to me, something worth paying attention to because, well, if you're playing Rise of the Ronin, I think you see exactly what they're talking about here. I think they definitely nailed the sense of freedom, but they also uh, seemingly maintained a relatively complex level of uh, combat. That's kind of what they're known for. I know people have said that it's not like Neo. It's very different. Maybe it's more streamlined. Now, I haven't played these other games, but I can say that I think they did a very good job kind of finding this balance with Rise of the Ronin, where they have created an open world with what I think is an interesting story and interesting characters, but also really great gameplay that goes a little bit deeper than maybe what you would expect, especially with the combat. And so they are kind of hinting at their next game here. Of course, we don't know what their next game is going to be. We don't know if we can expect a sequel to Rise of the Ronin, but they are letting us know that everything they put in Rise of the Ronin here, they're going to take that and they're going to build upon that with their next game, which I guess wouldn't be too surprising, but it maybe does confirm that going forward from Team Ninja, they're going to create open world games. And honestly, I'm totally on board with that. I'm absolutely enthralled with Rise of the Ronin and I hope more people get to experience it because I think that they created a great game here. Anyway, guys, that's going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it informative. If you did, be sure to leave it a like, subscribe to the channel if you're new, hit the bell notification icon, and feel free to share this video out on top of all that. But until next time, guys, take care.